Coming up on our next installment of America's Hope. She's a trailblazer among women. Claudette Robinson, better known as the First Lady of Motown. She was there when it all started. We'll talk to her about her wonderful, incredible career. That's next on America's Hope. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Wright, and this is America's Hope. Wherever you are, we hope that you're safe and well, taking care of yourself and your family because you matter. You matter to God, you matter to your family, you matter to your country, and therefore you matter to the world. Like I said, you are important and you matter. And speaking of matters most to people, uh, they are always concerned about their legacy or, or their significance. Well, tonight we're going to introduce you to someone who has really established a legacy that will live for many, many years to come and inspire young women throughout the world, no matter what color they are, no matter what faith background they have. It will be a story to inspire you. And if you love music, well, you're going to love this next guest. She is, without a doubt, as uh, Barry Gordy calls her, the founder of Motown, by the way, he calls her the first lady of Motown. Her name is Claudette Robinson, and she joins us, and I'm so honored to have you on. And in full disclosure, she is someone that I consider a dear, dear friend. We don't get to talk enough, Claudette, but God bless you, and thank you for being on America's Hope. Uh, how are things going with you and, and all the great things that you've done? Well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And it's great, great, great to see you because it's been much too long, as you were saying. And everything is coming along well. You know, I'm doing fine. Thank the Lord for that. And I'm um, healthy. And, you know, just doing a number of things to try to uh, keep it rolling and keep it going in terms of the career and my personal life. And you look great. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's just wonderful. It's fantastic to have you on. So, you know, a lot of people, when they when they consider you as the, the first lady of Motown, uh, they, they think about Motown, Claudette Robinson, Smokey Robinson, the miracles, how it all began. And, and now you, there's an exhibit about you and your life and the contributions that you've made to music and America at the Motown Museum. Talk to me about that exhibit, which launched in November of 23, and I understand will stay there until November of 24. Well, thank you. I was very, very, extremely honored that uh, they chose me as uh, being the next recipient of uh, the exhibit that's there at the Motown Museum. It's going to be there for a full year, which I'm so excited about. But they started with a different angle, and that is that they wanted to show me from basically my beginning as being a very small girl you know, born in Louisiana, which a lot of people were not aware of. And then some of the things that I've done throughout, whether I was like in high school, uh, you know, on a basketball team, <laughs> high school, <laughs> you can believe that. And, you know, so many different things that I've done because I did a lot of volunteering in the classrooms because my first choice of a career actually was to become a teacher. And uh, they were like, a teacher? How'd you get into music? Well, I always loved music, but I really loved being, I thought, in the classroom with children even more. I was also a part of the Marine Corps, and so they're showing a little bit of this in the exhibit. And so I think it's one to really, really see. So I encourage everyone, if they go to Detroit, to make sure they stop by the Motown Museum and be sure to see the exhibit. As a matter of fact, I plan on doing that this year. I love Detroit, and I love going up there. And, and to get to the Motown uh, Museum would be a delight to see uh, Claudette Robinson exhibit. Uh, and you mentioned some things that you just kind of you know, said because it's part of who you are. But the fact that you wanted to be a teacher and the fact that you served the United States uh, as a member of the Marine Corps, thank you for your service. And... Uh, back then, there weren't many women who decided to, oh, I think I'll become a Marine. <laughs> so what motivated you to do that? 
Well, I think from the beginning, uh, there was a picture of me as a little girl, and one of my, our family members was in the army, and he came back and he put his cap on me. <laughs> and so I think from that time uh, on, I really, really thought of the military because I wanted to do something that would serve our to serve our country to be available to do things for people because I always had like my heart thinking about what can I do for others. It wasn't so much what I can do for me, but I wanted to really be able to contribute something. And when I would see people that go into the military, what was, what I would see is they went in and, you know, they shaped them up and they just had such high hopes and you know, to be able to serve the world and do some things that would make make a difference and not just, uh, you know, we all have got a purpose and something to do, but that was one of the things I really wanted to do. My goal was actually to marry a uh, full Marine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, like, and you say, why the Marines and not the Army or one of the others? Well, the Marines really had something when I went to visit each and every one of their facilities. It just gave more to what I thought I would like to be. There, you're correct that there were not many women, not many women at all. Yeah, particularly for, women of uh, color. No, 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 no. There, I was able to in, get two of my friends <laughs> to go along with me. And we were the only three out of the entire unit that were people of color, women of color. You, you know, that's a, it's quite a story. You said something else that I picked up on how you wanted to uh, serve. Uh, did that come from your upbringing in Louisiana? What was that like as a little girl growing up in Louisiana? Well, growing up in Louisiana, I was quite different than when I moved to Michigan, actually. I moved to Michigan. I had been living with my grandmother. My grandmother passed away when I was eight years old. And that's when uh, my mother, who had already been in Michigan, came and got me. And that's how I got to Detroit. But uh, one of the things of being able to serve, my mother always and my grandmother were always doing things to serve others. Uh, my grandmother was like the secretary of the church and her brother, he was. <laughs> My mother, my grandmother's brother actually was the pastor of the church. So they were constantly doing things, you know, we went to church a lot <laughs> because of that. And, uh, but it's so interesting that that was a Baptist church, but my grandmother sent me to Catholic school. So my first years of schooling were actually in Catholic, in the Catholic religion and school, even though they were both, uh, I would go with my grandmother to the Baptist church, and then in school, I'd be, you know, go through all the things that they did. But I will say one thing. They gave me an excellent, excellent education, because by the time I was eight years old, I was already in the sixth grade. And people say, well, how'd you do that? And I said, I don't know. They kept double promoting me, and uh, that's what happened. So I think Brilliant. service was something that I saw happening both um, – at home and uh, in their daily lives, you know. So I think it just became a part of, you know, things that I thought were good. You know, that's so refreshing uh, to hear how it all went for you in your early years. And of course, it led to some miraculous moments. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. We're gonna take a slight break. When we come back, we will talk to the First Lady of Motown, Claudette Robinson, about something called miracles. That's next. Welcome back to America's Hope. So this episode is dedicated to a dear friend of mine. She's uh, right there, First Lady uh, of Motown, Claudette Robinson. And uh, you were just talking to me in the previous segment about your childhood, uh, Louisiana, then moving to Detroit and having uh, the kind of uh, wisdom poured into you from your mother and your grandmother and uh, the church and the Catholics who the whole, I mean, everything. You were always dedicated to a life of service and you served in the Marine Corps. Again, thank you for, for doing that because it, it just was not common back then 
for a black woman to say, I think I'll raise my hand and join the Marine Corps. And, and yet you did, and you did it well. But then you, you took to music. You wanted to be a teacher, and you actually started doing music. What got you into music and, and ultimately lead to you becoming a member of the Miracles? <laughs> well, um, in terms of uh, becoming a member of the Miracles, kind of just evolved. Music was always something that was in our home and, of course, in church. And I was always either in a choir or something to do with music because music was everywhere. It was something that we all loved and enjoyed. And uh, my brother actually had been in a group Every time he was in a group, when he was in the Orchids, I had a girls group called the Orchorettes. Uh, when he became a matador, I had a girls group called the Matadorettes. Well, my brother actually decided, nothing is happening with this music stuff. I am on my way to join the army. And that's what he did. We, uh, as our little girls group, the Matadorettes, we would listen to the guys. Sometimes we sing with them. They say they did all of their rehearsals in our basement at our house. So with that, um, I knew what the songs that they were singing, and an audition was coming about. With the audition coming about, Smokey had asked me would I go with them to the audition since my brother was not going to be able to uh, do that because not only did he join the army, they shipped him quickly out to Germany, and it was the Korean War. So he wasn't there, and I went to the audition uh, with the guys. We practiced a little bit before that. We had five original songs, so we thought, oh, it's going to be shoe in they're going to love us. <laughs> well, that was not true. Uh, they looked at the group, and the gentleman that we went to see, Alonzo Tucker, he decided he did not like the fact of a girl being in the background. And uh, he kept trying to encourage me to be uh, the lead singer. And I was like, no, they already have a lead singer, and this is not my group. So he, was, he said the world did not need another group that had a girl in the background. And with that, what he was referring to, he was referring to the group that was well known at that time, and that was the Platter. And uh, we, yeah. And so, um, you know, we didn't make it through that, but on the other hand, there was a gentleman looking at, at the group, and uh, that person happened to turn out to be Mr. Billy Gordon. Now, Smokey was super, super excited. He was like, when they said his name was Barry Gordy, unfortunately, I really hadn't heard of him, so I didn't know why Smokey was so excited. But the reason he was so excited is Smokey always had a, uh, I guess his vision was to become a songwriter as well as a singer. And um, when that, uh, when he met Mr. Gordy, because you would see, uh, there would be a, there was a magazine called Hit Parade is the title of the magazine. And in that they would have uh, the songs with all the lyrics and the name of the songwriter. So that's why he was so super excited about uh, meeting Mr. Gordy. And, you know, it's incredible because uh, <laughs> you're talking about the history of probably the most renowned music company in the world that launched as a Black-owned company in Detroit but you're also talking about what ultimately became the first group to sign to the label Motown. How did you come about with the name The Miracles? I know the story, but I'd like the rest of the world to hear it from you, how this group, along with you and Smokey and uh, some of your relatives, how did it become known as The Miracles? Well, the name of the group at that time, the guys were called The Matadors. So with them being called the Matadors, Mr. Gordon said that name does not suit a group that has a girl in the background or in the group. I shouldn't say the background, in the group. So they, he said, you've got to find a name and also we're going to have to record, you know, do a recording so that people can get to know who we are. 
We met Mr. Gordy in 1957, so this is like now we're to 1958. And what happened with the getting a name, everybody was asked to put names in a hat. And the names in the hat, I don't know which ones there were, but there was things like four gladiolas and a rose. <laughs> and so I was the one who pulled the name out, and the name happened to be the Miracles. Smokey says that he wrote the name Miracles. I don't know if he did or didn't, that's what he said. But I do know that I pulled the name out, and that uh, name was The Miracles. And that's how we became and history began because you went on, as I stated earlier, to become the first group signed to the Motown label. Uh, your first hit was Shop Around and your first million selling record, uh, Shop Around. Looking back on that time period, you were young. Um, all of you were teenagers and you're moving <laughs> into this brand new world of music. Did you ever think that your music would get to the heights that Motown would become the sound of young America and actually help America through some of its most difficult time period known as civil rights struggle? Well, in being honest, I never thought that it would happen <laughs> uh, because our first records were really not I won't say they were flops, but they were probably close to being uh, not recognized. At least our first uh, royalty check was such a very small amount of uh, $3.19, which was not from Motown. We had been with two other record labels prior to that, and that was uh, the END e &D record uh, company uh, out of New York, George Goldner and uh, Ben we also did a couple of songs with chess. Well, there was no, you know, there was a little bit of, as they say, noise in the industry, but not very much. And uh, it was when Shop Around actually became the million seller for Motown. Uh, that's when things changed around a lot, you know, where we were able to get uh, more money for uh, personal appearances as well as uh, you know, anything that you would do. And of course, everybody was excited about Motown because yeah. uh, there were so many people coming over. I mean, if you were to look at the list of all the people that signed up to become artists with Motown, it was even like Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. She came <laughs> over to sign up. And so it was all, you know, because they thought it was some sort of magic that was happening at, uh, you know, the company. But in all, in all honesty, when you're, I'm mean, not, you're thinking about it, I'm thinking, it was what would happen is we didn't always record in Studio A. We also recorded in Chicago. We recorded in New York. It was the talent. It was not the actual place that made a difference. However, Studio, Studio A was amazing, just amazing. I mean, it turned out USA. so smooth. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. Oh my goodness, Claude. It's it's like <clears throat> I'm talking to a woman of history. You're you were a pioneer and you have been duly noted as being a pioneer in the field of music, especially in R and B. And you're you know, you're there in the rock and roll hall of fame along with the miracles. You have a, a star uh, along with the miracles, uh the you know, the, the Hollywood uh walk of, of fame. It's just incredible to me that you're so down to earth and humble, and yet you are one of the most successful uh, women in a male dominated industry. How is that possible? <laughs> well, I think only by, first of all, I want to say by the grace of God, <laughs> that's probably first. And then the other thing is the fact that people around the world have been so absolutely wonderful and kind, you know, with their comments and what they think of me, because it's been a long time. You know, I was just thinking to earlier today, what I was thinking is, you know, I don't know how I could have been in this industry so long, and I'm not that old. <laughs> so it's like, okay. I mean, we're talking about 60 plus years that our career began, and it's like, well, 
I, I don't know if I'm quite that old, but I guess I'll have to admit to at least a few of those years. But wow. it's it's quite an honor for the things that you just said. I am I, I mean it touches my heart. I really, really am so grateful and thankful for the many wonderful things that have happened over these so many years. And you know, you saw some challenges out there. Uh, I want to take a break when we come back. Let's talk about some of those challenges as uh, with regard to uh, performing during an era of segregation before it became uh, integration, what you had encountered traveling uh, down south and places like that and, and how difficult it was for this, for this uh, wonderful group called the Miracles, uh, being able to merge and break the racial divisions of bringing black kids and white kids together and all God's children together. I'm talking to the First Lady of Motown, Claudette Robinson. We'll take a break, we'll be right back. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm talking to Claudette Robinson. She's known as the First Lady of Motown. She was there in the beginning when Motown got started. She was and still is a member of the Miracles, the first group that Barry Gordy signed to Motown Records. They went on to become the, the group to make the, the, the label known through their, their famous hit Shop Around, and then it was on. On and popping, as we like to say, because uh, so many groups came in after that, Claudette. Uh, the Temptations, The Four Tops, uh, Mary Wells, Martha Rees and the Vandellas. I mean, the list just keeps going on. Uh, Stevie Wonder, you know, it, it just so many brilliant people came in to represent this talent to the point that the industry around the world, they're, they're looking at Detroit as being like London with the Beatles invasion, you've got the invasion of Motown. You went around the country with the, Mo the was it the Motor City Review or the Motown Review? Uh, the Motown Review. So the Motown Review was, goes around the country and you've got Smokey and, well, all of you were the Miracles that back then. Smokey hadn't, uh, it hadn't become Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, but uh, you and Smokey became married at that time. You, you've got this family dynamic going on and but you're going to some tough places because there's this thing called segregation going on in America. What was that like? Uh, it was traumatic in a number of ways. Uh, even though I had been born in the South, I was a little girl when I left. So I didn't realize a lot of things that actually were happening. My grandmother made everything seem wonderful. It was like, uh, I didn't realize that even like in the water fountains, you know, like one said white and the other said colored, I thought colored water was going to come out. I didn't think it was like for a race yeah. or something. And I was a little disappointed, I have to tell you, that it was no colored water coming out. You know, it was all just the same old white water. Yeah. And even like, uh, you know, restrooms were segregated, you know, white men, white women, and then color. Color was for all, anybody, everybody that was not white, supposedly. And it was, uh, in going on the tours, it was, uh, you know, we often could not go, well, we couldn't go into the restaurants uh, because there was no, you know, no room for uh, blacks. I mean, it was like white only. And even if you stop to get gas, you know, sometimes they wouldn't even allow us to gas up because we were not touring initially in buses or planes or whatever. We were actually in a car. Our first road trips, it was like six people. We had uh, five miracles, Bobby, Ronnie, Pete, uh, Smokey, and uh, myself were the Five, and then our guitarist, Mark Tarplin, was the sixth person. And we would be traveling down the road. We'd get to these dates. Sometimes the dates were really, really hard to find where they were. You know, we even worked on a flatbed truck, which was a stage, and that was like in Kentucky in the, uh, it was a, um, uh, what do you call it, a tobacco field. And that was where the, and where it took place. And I'll tell you, when it came to, uh, you know, actually getting on stage and performing, many times the way the audiences were segregated, it would be sometimes whites on top, blacks on the bottom, you know, if it was like a two-story or vice versa. Or it would be one floor 
and they would have a rope down the middle of the um, wow. uh, floor, and it would be uh, there would be police officers there to enforce that they didn't cross over, that you know you didn't get to the wrong side. And they had billy clubs in their hands if somebody were to cross and you know try to maybe go to the other side because kids they didn't care. They were not even concerned about, you know, what color you were. They just wanted to enjoy the music and dance. And it was that one of our engagements that we had, Smokey said, We're not gonna do this anymore. We're not going on we're not going on stage and perform if they keep on segregating the audience. Well, we were a little shaky about that because <laughs> we didn't know what was gonna happen, you know, what was right. gonna happen. And uh, it, Smokey's told them to take down the um, the ropes, you know, and that it was just going to be let everybody enjoy what they were going to do. And we did it, and for the very first time, it actually worked without anybody like getting hurt or hit on the head or whatever. And uh, that was the start of uh, at least the uh, beginning of not segregating the audience and. Fortunately, there was a young man, the young man that happened to take the rope down. He met with Smokey, I think maybe about a year ago. And he said, I was the one who had put those ropes up and I put those down. What and I didn't, isn't that something? After what all those years. And, yes. and as, as uh, you look back on that and you realize that, that Smokey and met this guy who took down that rope so that white kids and black kids could, you know, enjoy the concert together, dance together, be together. Uh, what was that moment like for you to realize that so many years later, this guy's still alive and he still appreciates that moment? Well, when I heard about it, I thought, oh, that is such a treasure. Number one, he said, I did not want to have those ropes up. And um, he said, I really, you know, the kids were all dancing and enjoying each other. So they wanted that to continue and go on. But, you know, he had higher ups, his bosses, who were saying, no, you can't do that. You've got to divide these people. You know, I was just mm -hmm. telling someone a story the other day in that, you know, like today it's accepted that people are called black. When I was a little girl, we were called colored. And if you use the word black, you know, even black on black, people start fighting. They did not, they did, they did not want that to take place. And that was between all of our own race. And it was only when James Brown came out with, I'm black and I'm proud that people began to embrace the fact that it was okay to be called black. You know, uh, <laughs> you bring up James Brown and someone else that uh, I was just blessed to, to get to, to say hello to and meet for a few moments before um, when he was at the height of his career and interviewed his daughter subsequent uh, to, well, after his death, of course, meeting his daughter. but. Uh, what you talk about, Claude, it reminds me of the camaraderie that uh, that artists had back then, uh, not just uh, not just black uh, artists, but white artists, because there you are in the height of the civil rights struggle. I also know that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, of course, uh, campaigning to uh, end uh, segregation, to also get voting rights and civil rights acknowledged and Motown's rising up and getting this music to bring people together just like uh, you guys did when they took down that rope. And it wasn't until you got to London to perform that you really it really occurred to all of you that you were part of this movement and unbeknownst to you, you had affected the entire world uh, and some notable people came to your hotel room to tell you and that caused you to have your eyes open and say, oh my God, we are doing more than just uh, getting people to dance together. What was that moment like when the Beatles came to your room? <laughs> well, it was amazing. You know, listen, first of all, we knew of the Beatles. We didn't realize at that time that they knew of us. And they told us that what they did is that they used to practice 
speaking English by listening to our songs and really emulating from that uh, so that they could speak better English. And so, of course, we were flattered, we were honored, all of those things because, you know, the Beatles, are you kidding? But they were so, um, they were charming, they were lovely, and of course, I love the accent, you know. But it was a wonderful time that uh, we had been able to uh, transfer some of our music uh, over to them and let them not only just know about it, but to really appreciate it. And that was quite an honor. You know, uh, we could talk forever. Uh, I want to take a break. When I come back, I'd like to talk to you about the, the, what you've done now to uh, beyond the museum exhibit, but you've also written a book to, to, to remind children and help educate children on Motown and what it means and, and how uh, children have responded to your children's book. I'm talking to Claudette Robinson, First Lady of Motown. What an incredible story. And it doesn't end. We're coming back with more in just a moment. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm talking to a very uh, good lady, uh, someone I consider a, a friend or a good acquaintance, uh, First Lady of Motown, Claudette Robinson. You know, you've done so much musically, and you found out that your music was social. You got John Lennon, Paul McCartney, uh, George Harris and Ringo Starr coming to your hotel room as you and the Miracles are touring in London. And it occurs to you then, oh, maybe this music thing is really bigger than what we thought. <laughs> I just find that so, one, it shows the humility that you had. You got your head down, you're doing the job, you know what you're up against in America, you know that uh, the social structures in America are still tied to racism and division, and yet you see it unraveling. Uh, part of it because of the music that you're doing and bringing people together, and then you go abroad and see that people are applauding you from, from outside the country. Um, you've got quite a history to tell, and you, you kind of put some of it together in this wonderful book that you wrote. Tell me about your children's book and how that's helping uh, school-age children today understand who they are and who they can become? Well, you know, I've been writing, first of all, my biography for the last 30 years. <laughs> Hopefully it'll come out very soon. And so it was probably time for Motown's 60th anniversary. I said, I've been talking about a book, a book, a book. And I said, it's time that I wrote something. What audience has Motown not tapped into was my thought. And I thought, hmm, children. Children of today probably have no idea who the first group was or the first lady or any of the above. And I thought, let me see what I can do to let them know of the first group and the first lady at the same time. And it's called Claudette's Miraculous Motown Adventure. And I just wanted not only just children, but people to have an idea of some of the things that happened and who we were and all of the above. And I'm still, by the way, working on that biography. <laughs> but uh, it was an opportunity to be able to allow our young people, you know, from today to know something that happened yesterday. And they can learn from that. Uh, you know, you, you have been a leader um, and you, you do it quietly. Yet uh, you've done it with a lot of class and a lot of uh, dignity. Have we gotten away from that today? As you look at the, the musical landscape of the world today, um, have we kind of lost some of the class that we used to have and the dignity? Because I know at Motown you had a charm school. You were taught how to, 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 to walk, to talk. There's etiquette and, and there's just class all the way around. Well, I thank you for saying that, but I think some of that, you're, you're correct, some of that has gotten lost along the way in, in the last, I don't even know how many years, is that we don't think so much about what we consider as class. In fact, I think sometimes we stepped over into the other world and allowed that world to become what should have been, what we would say, a class act. Uh, Mr. Worry was very uh, assured, I mean, he assured all of us 
that this is something that we must do because we don't want to just be a black group. We want it to be a musical group, a group that sang music. It was music from black people, but it was music that should transcend to the whole entire world. And I think that's that was the goal and that was the dream. And I think he was very, along with the many artists, able to accomplish it. It was his vision and he had young people uh, that were talented in many ways and they became um, his I, platform, if you want to call it that, to make, yeah. uh, to bring it all together. And uh, I think that's kind of what happened, you know, in terms of uh, the music for the young people. And again, uh, I didn't show all of that in my book, which I hope to do in my biography, but there were so many wonderful stories and so many wonderful things I feel that happened while I was either on the road or off the road, and even today, it's been an honor to be able to tell my story and talk to young people because a lot of things, they have no idea any of this ever even occurred. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to tell them that. Uh, I think it's refreshing because young people can look at you and read your book and hear your story and then they get the real meaning of what you had to endure and to persevere to get where you are today. Uh, successful, um, you're able to, to pass this on. Um, and, and to parents, what would you be your advice to parents today? I, you know, I, I know you're first lady of Motown, but there are a lot of parents who look at you and grandparents and uh, great grandparents who look at you and think, man, you know, I remember the miracles. And I used to hear Claudette sing. I've seen her on the stage with, with the miracles and they can hear you in those, in those records that, that uh, really lifted their spirits up. Well, um, first of all, what a what a something that um, an awesome feat that happened for all of these generations. Because I don't know exactly how much, but probably you know, the last what three or four generations of people who did know about us and were able to you know see some of the things that we did, and of course to be able to see me. Because unfortunately, I had to come off the road in uh, 1964 after you know eight years of being on the road, and uh, unfortunately, I had several miscarriages. And Mr. Gordy and Mr. Robinson thought that the best thing for me to do was to come off the road for my health sake. I was not in agreement with that. I must tell you, <laughs> initially, because I didn't know if I would ever have children. But I was blessed to have two grown adult children now, and. Um, they're not even children, they're young people, they're young men and women, and my son Barry, Barry William Baroque, and Pamela Claudette. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, and then I have three grandchildren. I have Lyric, Thomas, and Alexis. Lyric is uh, Tamela's daughter, and the twins, uh, Thomas and Alexis, are my son Barry's uh, children. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a lot going on, a lot that has gone on, and meeting people of different generations, and then letting them, for the ones that perhaps do not know the story, then this is a way to get them to be able to know some of the things that went on. Because they were like, you were there before the Supremes? And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe about five years before, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, you were there before all these other people. So it's, it's a a tool and a learning uh, lesson for many, many people who, first of all, none of them ever knew that there was a girl, a female that was actually in the group with the, with the guys. Because unfortunately, many times when they show pictures, you only see the four guys and then the girl is missing completely. <laughs> That's you. I called it, uh, I was there. And, and now, we get to this part because you were there in the beginning when it all began. You, Barry Gordy, Smokey Robinson, the rest of the, the members of the Miracles, you're all there in the beginning. And, and then you, you start seeing these groups coming in. So I've got to ask you your description of the people that you got to know. Let's start with Stevie Wonder, who became a good friend of yours. 
Well, of course, Stevie Wonder was actually brought to the company by Ronnie White, one of the miracles. Ronnie lived uh, on the same street that uh, Stevie and his family. And so as a result, he heard him, you know, singing and playing all these instruments because uh, Stevie was talented from the beginning. I mean, he's probably born playing instruments. I don't know. But that was the, the first person and I, you know, I knew Stevie because he didn't live that far from where we were living. And, uh, but he was so extremely talented because his mother actually did not treat him like a person that could not speak. She treated him like he was a regular boy. He would climb trees, you know, he'd ride a bicycle. Um, all these things that seeing people do, he did those things. And uh, I understand that as an adult, he's even driven a car. But I'll tell you what, John, you see him here. <laughs> but what a genius. What a musical genius. Yeah. Uh, you were in the Absolutely. room where it happened. Uh, a young group from Gary, Indiana, to Jackson 5. And what happened after that? What did you see in the room that mesmerized you, Barry Gordy, Smokey, and the rest of the world? Well, I think for, especially Michael, uh, I think, what was he, maybe nine or ten, I'm not sure exactly of his age, but he had the ability to sing like nobody else. I mean, he did not sing like a child because there's no way he could have experienced any of the things that he was singing about because, you know, one of the songs was Who's Loving You? which of course is a miracle song. And of course, people don't realize that, you know, they all think it's a Michael Jackson song. But uh, he had just this genius talent from the beginning. And I guess the dad had worked with him and the whole entire family. Not only did they have the talent, they were able to exhibit that talent and be able to show it to the world as it's gone on. And unfortunately, you know, we lost Michael at way too long early or too young but uh, unfortunately as time goes by we see many of our genius talents that are, have been a part of Motown or other record companies who are no longer with us and it's it's unfortunate but I guess yeah. it's the way it is. It, it is unfortunate and very sad uh, and yet uh, he left such a legacy. Uh, uh, one other person who actually was recognized as having one of the greatest songs of the century, What's Going On? Uh, the late oh, great Marvin Gaye. Well, with Marvin Gaye, I was fortunate enough to be able to be in on one of his many, many sessions, and that is, is when he was recording What's Going On. Uh, Bobby Rogers, one of the miracles, who was also my cousin, uh, we, Bobby is actually on What's Going On. There's a part in there that he has his voice, you know, doing the growling or something or whatever he was doing but marvin was so you know when you think about all these people of talent that you just wonder where did it all come from because for you know we were all really still young nobody was old most of the talent from motown started as teenagers 18, 19, 20, you know, uh, I don't think there was any person that was a part of Motown that was 25 yet. And, you know, that's something when you think about all the things that they were able to do in such a short time. Because once Shop Around became a million seller, I'll tell you, it seems like the whole world did an influx of, we've got to get to Detroit, <laughs> we've got to make this hit record because that's where it's coming from. It's got to be right there in Studio A. So Claudette, first of all, I want to thank you for being on the program and, and, and giving us this very in-depth interview about your life and, and, and your legacy in music. And I, I've got to ask you, you know, Barry Gordy coined the phrase that Motown was the sound of young America. Based on what we see happening in America today, what's your message and hope for all of America. My hope for America is for us all to be able to, I don't know if this is just a dream, but for us to come together. You know, irregardless of your race, your 
religion, your nationality, or any of the things that people probably put a lot of focus on that doesn't need to be. Because if we can just learn to live with each other, you don't have to love people, but at least have a liking for them as human beings and know that everyone, everyone on this earth has something to offer. I always say it takes all the pieces of the pie to make it whole. Thank you, Claudia Robinson, you. First Lady of Motown. Thank you for everything that you've done and being on America's Hope. Appreciate you so much and the legacy that you've given us from the music to the life that you've been living as a pioneer, a trailblazer, uh, a woman a one among women. Thank you so much. God bless you. But I'd like to thank our guest, First Lady of Motown, Claudette Robinson. What a life, what a legacy. She epitomizes the true spirit of a trailblazer here in America. Whether you're black or white, male or female, you can rise above any hurdle or obstacle to make it to the top. And like so many songs from Motown, she represents what it means to reach out and touch somebody's hand make this world a better place if you can and for Claudette she really proved ain't no mountain high enough until next time America good night God bless <laughs>